Yo, what's up guys? So today we are gonna see, what if, Naruto got harem with Azula, Mai, Tai Li, Tof and Jun, part 1. Hope you'll enjoy this video. So before we start, go check out the author of this fanfic, Namike09, link is in the description. And also subscribe to my channel, and like this video. Let's begin the video. In a dimensional void Naruto Ozumaki Namikaze, the Naidame Rikuro Sinin, Second Sage of the Six Paths, Rokudame Hokage, Six Fire Shadow, and new Jinchuriki of the Jirbi was falling all around him was complete darkness with a light that was rapidly approaching him. Before the light engulfed his person, and then he fell through an opening, and now found himself free falling at terminal velocity toward the ground. The blonde cursed, and knew if he hit the ground from his current height, he would die. With no other option he goes through a set of hand seals before stopping at a tiger seal, and his cheeks bulge. He then spits out what looks like a torrent of lava that lands on the ground, and spreads out before the mound turns white. As he makes contact, he bounces a few times on the soft substance, and then slides down the slope he created before sighing in relief. Man talks about a close call. The blonde sage muttered, as he slowly got up. He takes in his surroundings, and used his knowledge of the situation, and what he knew of Jukuka ninjutsu, space slash time techniques, deducing that Toby had at the very least intended to trap him in a dimensional void that he created for eternity. But luckily it had also ripped a secondary tear to this place, which was probably different from his own. So with that, Naruto realized that he is now permanently staying in this new world, and that the now deceased Toby was probably laughing at him from the grave. And it pissed him off that he allowed the bastard to pull that sneak attack. I hope that asshole rots in the deepest pit of hell, or the Shinigami's stomach for all eternity. You may have gotten the last laugh Toby, but with you gone, my world can start rebuilding itself, and now have actual peace with you gone he said before getting up, and dusted his coat off. After this, he walked throughout the area, and found a nearby settlement that seemed to be abandoned, judging from the torn down buildings. He then hops onto a wooden post, and crouches down in a ninja-like fashion scouting his surroundings with keen eyes. He paused when the sound of fighting echoed through his ears, and turned his head in the direction of where it occurred. He activates the Rinnegan, and narrowed his eyes to get a closer look, noticing that someone was fighting inside the abandoned village. That person happened to be a beautiful girl around his age dodging attacks from six different enemies who were, to his surprise, shooting elements like fire, earth, water, and air at her, and one threw a projectile at her while she was defending herself with blue fire. He frowned at the one-sided battle because she was being backed into a corner from all sides, and knew at this rate she wasn't going to last long so he reaches into his pouch, pulling out a military ration pill, and swallows it down, feeling the energy he lost when fighting Toby returned to him now to even the odds. With that, Naruto leapt off the post, and moved like a yellow blur across the landscape. Meanwhile, Azula, the princess of the Fire Nation, daughter of Fire Lord Ozai, and Lady Ursa, and fire-bending prodigy found herself cornered by Avatar Aang, the last airbender, and his friends, as well as her older brother Zuko, and Uncle Iroh had her surrounded ready to unleash their bending attacks on her. Azula frowned, as she witnessed how her targets slash foes had backed her into a corner, and now she was trying to figure out a way on how to change this situation. She knew her lightning bending was out of the question due to the fact that it took too long to produce, and that her uncle could redirect lightning if she made the attempt, and critically injure if not kill her. Her only option was to either surrender until finding a means of escape, or for her two friends Mai and Tai Li to arrive and assist her. Just as she was pondering on what to do a blur leapt from behind the broken wall, and landed in between a surprised Azula and her offenders. The interloper seemed to be 5'11", 17 years old, and wore what looked like a short sleeve long white coat with red, blue, and golden flames licking the edges. On the back was the kanji Naidame no Senku, Second Flash, and Naidame Rikudo Sinin, Second Sage of the Six Paths. He also wore a dark green flak jacket with a long sleeved black shirt underneath it, black cargo pants, and what appeared to be umbu style boots with saws covering the feet. On his black shirt were two bands he wore on each sleeve and he also wore black fingerless gloves with metal plates on them, and engraved in them were spirals. He had shoulder-length wild spiky golden blonde hair with jaw-length bangs framing both sides of his face, and strapped to his back were two large scrolls. He slowly stood up while the wind blew through his hair, and made his coat flutter like a cape while the others looked at the newcomer. Naruto looks up at the group with purple-grayish eyes that seem to have four ripple-like rings, and a pupil, and then turns his head to Azula who was now slightly frightened of her new position and his appearance until he gave her a nod of assurance, telling her he was on her side. He then turns his head towards the group, and frowns at them. I may not know what's going on here, 
but six against one isn't a fair fight, he said. Iroh frowned at the newcomer's appearance, and narrowed his eyes in a calculative fashion, as he studied Naruto's form, and could tell already that the teenage Kage was not one to take lightly. Our fight is not with you young man, please step aside. He asked Naruto who smirks, and shakes his head in a negative fashion. Sorry old man, but that's not gonna happen because now I plan on evening the odds. This had put everyone on edge for a few moments, but knew that they had to get past him if they wanted to defeat and capture Azula so each person launched their strongest bending attack at the blonde, and Sokka threw the boomerang his father gave him. Naruto smirked, as the elemental attacks, and boomerang headed into his direction, and held one hand out. Azula's eyes widened when she saw the attacks head towards her mysterious savior, wondering if he was crazy for taking on the four elements that would practically injure him critically or kill him until he spoke. Relax beautiful, I got this, he said, and Azula felt her face heat up when he called her beautiful. As the attacks got closer, Naruto said only two words, Shinra Tensei. When he said that, a powerful force repelled the attacks, and sent each element back to the users. In got blown back by the air blast he shot, Katara stumbles back. As she gets drenched in water, Tof was forced to dodge her earth attack, and Zuko. And Iroh had to do the same lest they want to get badly injured by the flames, Sokka wasn't. As fast, as the others, and was hit square in the stomach by his boomerang, and sent flying, hitting the ground hard. Azula's eyes widened in disbelief when she saw him repel the elemental attacks by saying a few strange words she never heard of, and sending them back to the benders. Seeing their stance break, Naruto took this opportunity to move in a burst of speed, and attack the closest target, who happened to be Zuko. When the banished prince tried to get his bearings back he felt the wind get knocked out of him due to Naruto striking him with a powerful palm strike to the chest, knocking him backwards, off his feet, and crashing onto the ground, tumbling and skidding back leaving a narrow skid mark. This move surprised Iroh due to the unnatural speed and strength their quarry displayed. Tof stomps the ground causing a cube-shaped rock to shoot from the ground, and punches it, sending the projectile at her target. Naruto spun around with his fist cocked back, and swung it forward, smashing the flying rock with his fist, and reducing it into dust and pebbles, shocking the blind earthbender when she felt a raw strength behind the move through the vibrations in the ground. Naruto then swung his left hand sideways, sending several shuriken at her, and she reacted by raising both of her arms up, having a wall of earth rise in front of her, and the shuriken were embedded into it. He was about to attack again, but then his senses went on full alert, and somersaulted into the air, evading a stream of air that was fired by Aang, and summoned wind chakra into his right arm. Yuha Shou, beast wave palm, Naruto swings his arm in a diagonal slash, releasing a slicing chakra wind wave that descends towards the airbender. Aang's eyes widened in shock and disbelief as he saw their new opponent airbend, but snaps out of his state and flips backwards as the air blade hits the ground, leaving a cleanly cut trench in the ground. Naruto takes this opportunity and inhales some air into his lungs. Futan de Tapa, wind release great breakthrough, he aims his move at Aang and unleashes a gust of wind upon the young monk. Aang shouts out in surprise as he was blown backwards by the powerful gust of wind which knocked him over an abandoned building, and sent him crashing down hard. Iroh witnessed the encounter with wide eyes, as he has never before seen someone not only move with such speed and precision, but also repel elemental bending moves with an unknown force or even air bend, as he thought all the air nomads minus Aang were dead. His facial expression shifted to a sharp and focused one, and then got into a stance with his arms stretched outwards from opposite sides and moved in a circular motion. Once Naruto landed back on the ground, the sound of electricity cackling got his attention, and he turned around, only to get wide-eyed, as he saw Iroh generate lightning in a circular fashion, and in a form he's never seen before. Not willing to take a risk, Naruto took the safe route, and did a quick series of hand seals before aiming his right arm down, and clutching it with his right hand around his wrist. Lightning chakra engulfs his left hand, and cackles to life, making a sound that sounded like birds chirping. Chidori, 1000 birds. Azula's eyes widened in awe and amazement, as she saw lightning cackle around the stranger's arm, and then dashed towards Iroh with his technique chirping to life, and it trailed around his left hand. Iroh then shot his right hand forward releasing a bolt of lightning at his foe with Naruto swinging his lightning-coated arm at the descending blast. When the two attacks collide, a flash of light occurs, forcing Katara, Azula, and Tof to cover their faces with their arms. Naruto skids back a little, as the force from the blast counteracts his speed, but he holds his ground, as the attack splits in two, and bypasses him in the air. 
Zuko slowly got back up after shaking the cobwebs out of his head, and when he regained his vision, his eyes widened, as he saw his uncle's strongest attack get cut in two by the blonde sage, and the same went with Aang who was gobsmacked. When the attack died down Iroh was beyond surprised, as he saw Naruto with his arms stretched outwards with lightning cackling around his left hand, and didn't seem to have any form of injury in his person aside from the static that shot around parts of his body. A smirk formed on Naruto's face, as his technique remained active, and then slammed it onto the ground. Chidori Nagashi, 1000 birds current, he releases an electronic discharge upon the ground, and towards Iroh. Said man felt pain erupt all around his body, and he cried out in pain, as he got electrocuted. No! Zuko shouted out, and with an enraged yell, he rears his arms back, and throws them forward, releasing a powerful stream of fire at Naruto. The sage sees this from the corner of his eyes, and does a ram seal. Swayton, Mizudepo, water release, water gun, Naruto spews a large yet powerful jet stream of water at the fire blast, resulting in the flames dissipating instantly, forming a small steam fog. Zuko cancels his attack, as he sees the fast projectile head right at him, and rolls to the left side, as it hits the ground. The water technique was so strong that it tore through the earth, much to the scarred teenager's shock. When Naruto manages to force them back, he flips backwards, and lands beside Azula who just stared at him in awe at the skills he displayed. Naruto performs a few hand seals, and slams his hand on the ground. Kuchios no jutsu, summoning jutsu, dot. He called out, and a puff of smoke appeared. When it cleared, an elephant-sized Chinese dragon with red scales, black long single whiskers, a black underbelly, large bat-like wings, ivory spikes that started at its neck, and ended to its tail along with four limbs that had long curved white claws and it had a pair of yellow-red colored eyes with slit pupils appeared before its summoner snorting out puffs of smoke from its nostrils. The dragon looked at Naruto, and bowed its head. You summoned me Naruto-sama? It asked in a deep voice. Sokka groaned, and sat up, rubbing his stomach while the others looked at the dragon the newcomer had summoned. He blinks in confusion, and sees them look at the creature, and gawks when he sees the beast. Azula looked like she was gonna faint from shock because standing a few feet away from her was an actual live dragon that was talking before hearing Naruto speak up. Just one second, he says, and performs a series of hand seals. Katan, Guryoka no Jutsu, fire release great dragon fire technique he fires a large fireball that morphed into a roaring dragon head, and ascended towards the horrified group, but instead of hitting them, it hits the ground, and causes an explosion that sent them flying backwards. Naruto motions for the dragon to lower its head which it did, and sits behind its hair. He then looks at Azula, and holds his hand out. Come on, take my hand. He offers it to the Fire Nation princess. Azula was at first skeptical at the offered hand, but realized that this person did save her life when he could have killed her, and the others if he wanted to. She takes his hand, and is pulled onto the dragon's back, and sits behind him. Hold on tight. This guy can fly pretty fast, he says, as the dragon raised its head and spread its wings. As Azula wrapped her arms around his waist, and held on, as tight, as she could, the dragon roared, and instantly took off into the sky, causing Azula weeks, and increasing her grip on his waist, as the wind blew in her face. Back with the gang, Aang, and his companions groaned, and slowly sat up, and looked at the large burning crater, and they looked around to see Azula along with that blonde interloper had left. He then saw Zuko with his uncle, who seemed to be injured with burns from his right arm, as well as his left leg from the fire blast. Katara ran over to the two, and saw the wounds Iroh had, and was about to pull out her pouch, and help him. Stay away from us, Zuko yelled, as he got in front of Iroh with his fighting stance. You guys have done enough for one day. Zuko, please, I can help treat your uncle's wounds. Katara tried to offer only to back away when an angry Zuko swipes his arms sideways, unleashing a wave of flames, as a warning. Leave, he roared in anger, surprising the group and reluctantly Aang, and his friends left Zuko, and Iroh, and got back on Appa, flying away from the two fugitive firebenders. As they took off on continuing their journey, their minds were filled with many questions on their flight with the main focus on the mysterious stranger who helped Azula. Sokka however let out a frustrating yell, and messed up his hair. I just don't get it. How did that guy block all our attacks without even doing anything? And how did he make that dragon appear out of thin air? He yelled. Who knows Sokka? but it would be best if we avoided him from now on," Katara stated, as she looked over her brother's wounds, while Aang sat there confused. What surprises me is the fact that he can bend fire, as well as water bend, air bend, and somehow bend lightning. How is that even possible? She wondered while Aang pondered on this, as well, 
and realized something. Earlier when he repelled our attacks it was not a form of air bending. If it was then I would have sensed the shifts in the air currents, but there was none at all. He released some type of force that was able to repel not just our elements, but weapons, as well, and it's nothing that even I have heard of. Ng answered, as his friends looked at him in shock and disbelief. So if it was not air bending, then what was it twinkle toes? Toe fast? As she faced the young monk? Even your air bending would have trouble against my earth bending since they're both opposing elements. I know that Toph, but I am very positive that what that guy did was not air bending. It was some form of invisible force that's even more powerful than my air bending. Ng said to his friends again, as they were both scared and confused at what he just said. But afterwards he was able to bend the air in a way that was practically above the level of a master. But from the way he was able to cut through the earth his form is completely different. I think we should avoid that guy at all costs, until I can speak to Avatar Roku again. He warned because if their new foe was capable of using the elements like he could, then who knows what else he could do. I agree. Until we can get an idea on who this guy is, we should avoid him at all costs because it is a possibility that he could be stronger than Aang. Katara stated, and everyone nodded their heads in agreement. Meanwhile, Naruto and Azula were riding across the sky on the dragon he summoned, and the princess of the Fire Nation couldn't believe that she was riding on a living breathing dragon. She thought they were all extinct since the last dragon was killed off by her uncle. It was amazing yet terrifying, but she wouldn't show it, as she was secretly enjoying the ride. Azula then saw her tank, and tapped Naruto on the shoulder. Said blonde looked at her, and she pointed down to her entourage so Naruto looked down, seeing the machine, and nodded. Hey Suryu, head to that tank that's below us. He informs the dragon who nods, and dives down to the metal machine. Azula wasn't prepared for the drop, and held onto Naruto, as tight, as she could with her face heating up from the lean muscles she felt. Surya flared his wings, and landed slowly near Azula's transport. Naruto then hopped off, and helped Azula onto the ground, as well. Thanks for the lift buddy. He thanked the dragon. You're welcome, Naruto. Feel free to summon me anytime you require assistance. Suryu informed his summoner before returning back to the summoning realm in a puff of smoke. Afterwards, the young sage took this opportunity to check out his surroundings, and admired the sight of the forest. Man these forests are vast, they remind me of the ones around my home village. He mutters to himself until he feels a hand touch his shoulder. He turns his head, and glances at Azula who was staring at him in an oddly fashion because she carried a look of curiosity, as well as a form of keen interest within her gold-colored eyes. Naruto turned around, and rubbed the back of his head sheepishly. Oh sorry, I'm just admiring the scenery since it reminded me of my old home. He apologized. So are you okay? Those guys pretty much gave you a run for your money out there. Azula blinks a few times, but nods at the stranger's concern for her health even if they just met. I'm fine thank you, though I must admit the moves you displayed out there were very impressive especially when you split that lightning attack in half. She praised, even though she was a little jealous, she was still amazed at what he did. Never in her life has she seen a display of fire bending, water bending, air bending or lightning bending, and from the way he carried himself, he was a seasoned fighter that was capable of handling himself against more than one opponent, and keeping his cool despite being a few years older than her, and doubted if her father or uncle could face him in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Naruto on the other hand rubs the back of his head sheepishly. Thanks, but to be honest I wasn't showing my full strength in that fight since I haven't fully recovered from my trip to that abandoned village. He answered back because while he was recovering his strength, he actually had to try with that lightning strike Iroh unleashed on him since the move was extremely deadly, and would have done more than just zap him had it hit him directly. I'll take your word for it, but may I know your name warrior? Azula asks the blonde, and gets a positive nod. I'm Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze or for short call me Naruto, at your service my lady. Naruto introduced with a bow, and took her hand into his and kissed her knuckle in a gentlemanlike manner, causing a tint of pink to appear on her face, as he let her hand go. And may I know your name of the strong yet beautiful lady standing before me? He teased with a charming smirk on his face. Azula felt her face heat up more since no boy her age would try to approach her not just due to her royal status, as the daughter of the Fire Lord, but because she was trained more in the aspects of war than learning how to socialize with others especially when it came to boys, much like her brother Zuko was. I'm Azula daughter of Fire Lord Ozai, and Crown Princess of the Fire Nation, she said, which caused Naruto's eyes to widen, and let out a low whistle. Whoa, I just rescued a princess? First Korki-chan, Haruna-chan, Toki-chan, and lastly Shayan-chan? Well she was more of a priestess than a member of royalty in demon country, but whatever. 
I think Cammy gets his or her kicks out of messing with me for some reason when it comes to women of royal status. Wow, what are the odds of me saving a princess? Again those guys must be crazy to try and capture someone of royalty, Naruto stated. Azula on the other hand lets out a small chuckle and folds her arms over her chest. Yes, I am of high royal status within my country, but I'm not weak in any way, shape, or form like those other pampered girls who come from wealthy families. I was trained in the art of war and combat at a young age after all. She stated in A, as she was in no way, shape, or form a weakling. Naruto nodded in agreement. Yeah I could tell when you took on that guy with the scar on the left side of his face, and the bald monk kid with the arrow tattoo on his head, he said which got her attention. Wait, you saw me fight the Avatar, and my brother? Why didn't you help me then? She asked, giving him an accusing look which made him blink. Well the thought did come to me, but from my point of view, you were doing a fine job in handling both of them so I figured you had them beat until the rest showed up. You were amazing out there especially when you used blue fire. You're a very skilled Azulaheim, he said, and she smiled a little at his praise until he said Heim. What does Heim mean? She asked. Where I come from Heim means princess so I'm complimenting you using my people's form of language. He answered before sensing two others that were watching them close by. Not knowing if they were friend or foe, Naruto vanished and suddenly appeared with Mai and Tai Li with a hand on their shoulder. Mai had black hair that was tied in two braids going down her back and wore a dark red outfit. Tai Li had brown hair tied in a single braided ponytail and brownish gray eyes. She wore a light reddish pink two-piece outfit that showed her midriff. The two girls blinked in surprise, shock, and confusion, wondering how he knew where they were hiding, and managed to move them from their previous spot unnoticed, and Azula wondered the same thing, schooling a stunned expression. How did you never mind? My Tai Li, this is Naruto who helped me earlier when the Avatar and his group cornered me. These two are the team who are helping me track down and capture the Avatar. My specializes in using throwing weapons like knives and darts, and Tai Li here is skilled in acrobatics, hand-to-hand -hand combat and uses a technique that is capable of blocking a bender's chi which prevents them from using their bending powers for a limited time, she explained. Before Naruto could greet them, Tai Li landed in front of him with her face a few inches close to his, and stared into his eyes which made him nervous due to the fact that she was in his personal space. Whoa, your eyes look strange, and your hair resembles the sun, the petite girl said with a wide grin on her face while Naruto's sweat dropped. Is this your natural hair color? Tai Li wondered as she grabbed one of his bangs and rubbed it between her fingers. Oh, and it's so soft. She muses until my sighs and pulls her back by the back of her collar. Sorry about Tai Li, she's the oddball of the group, she said in a bored tone while patting the pouting girl on the head. Naruto shrugs and brushes his hair back with his hand. It's fine, and to answer your question Tai Li yes this is my natural hair color, and, as for my eyes you could say that these are a trait I inherited from an ancestor in my family bloodline that shows up in only a few generations, he says, and deactivates his Rinnegan, replacing them with a pair of cerulean eyes that had slit pupils. The three girls' eyes widened when he did that, and their jaws dropped. That was when Tai Li was in his face again, and a new sound escaped from her lips. Now your eyes are pretty like the ocean. How did you do that trick with your eyes? She asks, and is once again pulled away from him by Mai who apologizes again but is also curious in how he did that. I'll explain later, but first if I may Azula, why is it that you're after that bald kid and his friends, as well as who the chubby old man is? Is he your grandpa? He asks, causing a smile to form around her mouth, and she laughs slightly. He's not my grandfather, the chubby old man is my uncle Iroh, and the one with the scar burn was my older brother Zuko who has a tendency to be happy about nothing. The bald kid is the last of a group of airbenders who are known as air nomads and is currently the avatar. The only thing I cannot understand is how I am not able to capture them, as I thought if I had made my own special team, I would have less trouble in capturing one or the other. The fuming princess wondered. Naruto blinked a few times when he heard the name avatar. Capture the avatar? Naruto repeated to Azula who raised a brow while Mai and Tai Li blink a few times. He's the bald-headed kid with a blue arrow on his head. He is the avatar. She answered only to confuse Naruto more as he rubbed the back of his head in wonder. Um who's the avatar? Naruto asks. His question made the three of them look at him in shock and disbelief when he asked who the avatar was. Said blonde blinked a few times and scratched his cheek. What? Did I say something wrong? Azula manages to snap out of her stupor and narrow her eyes. You don't know who the avatar is? Everyone knows who he is. He's a master of the four elements, water, earth, fire, and air, she explains. After hearing that, Naruto scoffed, 
and folded his arms not looking interested at all in what he heard. So he can bend four elements, big deal. He said nonchalantly which almost made her fall over. As well as my to look at him oldishly. And Tai Li's jaw dropped. That's all you can say is so what? What's wrong with you? She practically yelled. And he shrugged nonchalantly. Nothing's wrong with me because like I said big deal if the kid can use four elements. I'm a master in using five elements. So you expect us to believe that you can take on the avatar weight. You said you're a master in five elements? There are only four elements which make up the four nations. And only a single person can only master one. She corrected me. Naruto smirked and shook his head in a negative fashion. Not where I came from, as there are more than four elements. My powers are beyond that of a bender, and there are more than four elements. There are actually 23, and it has taken me years to master them all. I also have powers that many would kill for, but will never be able to achieve. For example the five elements I've mastered are fire, water, earth, lightning, and wind with some of the secondary, and rare elements being light, darkness, gravity, yin, and yang. There are also some of the sub-elements which are wood, ice, storm, lava, metal, sand, blaze, crystal, dust, and scorch. He answered. Azula was silent for a while, and looked into his eyes for any form of deceit only to see none since she was skilled in the ways of using deceit due to her training. Really? Then prove it. Show us your power. She folded her arms over her chest, as she issued her challenge. Hearing this, Naruto chuckles, and nods. Very well then. But I won't be showing all of my powers, as I don't know you well enough to part with all of my secrets. Azula nodded her head in agreement, and watched him walk a couple of feet away from the trio, and stand in the middle of a field. Naruto inhales some air into his lungs, and pauses for a few seconds. Katan, Daimanji, fire release, fire blast. He unleashes a powerful white fire blast that shoots through the forest incinerating any trees that were in its path, and reducing them to ashes. The girls watched in awe, and amazement as they saw the flames burn a path into the forest. Naruto stops the fire, and then claps his hands together. Swishoha, water shockwave, he called out, and the girls watched, as a vortex of water swirled around him from the thin air, and then became a massive wave that washed over the remaining flames, and drenched most of the forest. Dotan, Doria Taiga, Earth Flow River. A large wave of mud flows through the ground, and spreads throughout the path, and then softens up the ground that was drenched in water. Naruto holds his right arm out, and then points his index and middle finger towards a tree. Blue sparks of electricity cackle, and dance around his fingers until a blue orb appears in the tips of his two fingers. Right on. Bayakurai. Lightning release. Pale lightning. Naruto fires a thin light blue beam of electricity towards the tree. And when it struck, it left a gaping hole in the tree. Afterwards Naruto inhales another breath of air, and his chest expands even more. Futan. Mugende Tapa. Infinite great breakthrough. Naruto exhales a gust of wind so powerful that it rips the trees off the ground and sends them flying. The girls were wide-eyed, and their jaws just hung open when they saw him use five elements. Naruto stopped, and couldn't help, but smirk at their reaction. So what do you girls think? Pretty cool huh? Naruto was met with silence, as his answer from the three, as they just looked at him with nothing, except awe. But after a few minutes passed Azula came out of her shock from what she had witnessed from the blonde, and spoke up. You said you mastered all the elements, but you only have done five from what you had said, would it be too much to ask for the sixth one? Naruto grinned, and popped his knuckles. Sure thing. Now to restore a part of the forest I destroyed. Naruto got down on one knee, and placed his hands in a form that looked like he was praying. Azula, Mai, and Tai Li watch, as Naruto stays in that position until they witness several small trees sprout from the clear path Naruto made. Mokutan Hijutsu, Jukai Koten, would release secret technique he said, and suddenly a large amount of trees sprouted, and covered up the path Naruto cleared earlier, and also regrew the trees that were blown away by his wind. After doing that, Naruto placed his hands on the ground. No, that was when a two-story wooden house shot up from the ground and, so what do you think? Naruto asked, as he was now sitting on the roof of the said house. The girls were silent, and Azula spoke up. Amazing, this is so unreal. You really are a master in the elements, she said as Naruto leaps off the roof, and grins. Told ya, he said. My looks at the trees he restored, and at the wooden house, and for the first time, a true smile formed on her lips. I can already tell that things won't be boring with you around Naruto. Tai Li on the other hand was jumping for joy, and was hoping to stay in the house then sleep in the transport tonight. That was amazing Naruto. Azula, can we rest in the house tonight, can we please? Tai Li begs, and gives the fire princess the puppy eyes. Azula's eye twitched from the size of her friend's eyes and sighs. 
Yes, Tylee. We can stay in the house for tonight only. We have to stay on the Avatar's trail. She says while the energetic girls squealed in joy, and the glomps Azula. Naruto's sweat dropped when he saw this, and leaned next to Mai. Is she always this bubbly? He asks the silent girl who nods and sighs. Sadly yes, we don't know where she gets the energy. She answered, and Naruto's sweat drop grew when he saw the girl rub her cheek against Azula's, and said the princess's bow was twitching dangerously, as well as blowing puffs of blue fire out of her nostrils. Remind me to never ever give her any sweets otherwise Azula would kill her, and me. Naruto says which makes my cover her mouth, and giggle, and then goes to pry the acrobat off of Azula before saying girlfriend to her with a bolt of lightning. Afterwards Tai Li, Mai, and Azula got a few of their things, and went into the house. When Azula walked past Naruto who was leaning against a tree with his arms folded, she stops, and looks at the blonde who opens both of his eyes, smiles, and winks at her. This action makes her blush, and walk into the house faster while Naruto chuckles to himself. I still got it, he says while Azula had other thoughts in her mind about Naruto. What's wrong with me? Why am I acting like this over him? I just met the guy for crying out loud even though he is strong, a powerful warrior, and good looking. Come on, Azula got it together. Your priority is to capture the Avatar, and those traitors first. She thought, as she made it to a fully stocked room that had a soft bed, and everything. She sets her stuff down, and removes the golden crown headpiece that held her hair in, and lets her waist-length hair fall down. Besides, I doubt that he'd be interested in me anyway. Most guys in the Fire Nation aren't due to my reputation. She said to herself with a hint of sadness, and pulled a comb out of her bag, and brushed her hair back in slow strokes. Unknown to her, Naruto was sitting on top of the roof, watching Azula using the Tongei no Jutsu telescope technique, with a crystal ball sitting on his lap, and noticed a look in her eyes that reminded him of Gara's when they first met, but then was able to help change his way of proving his existence. I may not know you Azula home, but I will do everything I can to help you once I figure out what goes on in this world. He says to himself before performing the tiger, dog, and snake seal. Tajumo Kutan Bunshin no Jutsu, multiple wood clone technique. On top of the roof, several wood clones materialized around Naruto, and became perfect replicas of him. I need you all to travel around the area, and track this so-called avatar, and his group along with Azula's brother, and uncle, but do not engage them. He instructed. The clones nodded, and each leapt off in a blur in different directions, leaving Naruto by himself. A few hours later, it was easy for the wood clones to track down their targets due to their ability to merge with the plant life around them, and spy on them with the group noticing especially since the blind earth bender had the ability to sense irregular vibrations through the earth, and the same occurred when one of them managed to find Iroh, and Zuko was said old man currently recovering from the injuries the real Naruto inflicted on him. After watching the group, one of the clones casts the Nian Shoujo no Jutsu, Temple of Nirvana around the Avatar's group along with Iroh, and Zuko who were in an abandoned shack up in a mountain terrain. Once they fell into a tranquil sleep, each of the clones approached one of the individuals, and used the mind reading technique, which he also learned from Inoichi, the intelligence division. It allowed him to enter a target's subconscious, and extract any information needed, even if the target had forgotten it by placing his hand on the victim's forehead. What he had learned about the situation, and the world in general was interesting with the major part being the avatar who is the spirit of the planet incarnated in human form and thus, the only physical being with the ability to learn all four bending disciplines water, earth, fire, and air. And his her duty was to keep the nations in balance using his powers, along with the reincarnation cycle which represented the four seasons spring, summer, fall, and winter along with their respective elements since whenever the avatar passed on, another would be reborn into another nation. From what he learned, Aang was the last of a group of monks who were known, as their nomads due to the instigator of the war. Fire Lord Sozin causing a mass genocide amongst the airbenders since the Avatar would be reborn in the air nation after the death of the previous one, and spent the last 100 years or so encased in a large mass of ice before being discovered by the Water Tribe siblings. From Katara and Sokka, he discovered that they lost their mother in a Fire Nation raid years ago, and their father left to aid in the war against the Fire Nation until they found Aang, and started their journey to save the world. From Tove Bay Fan he learned that she was from a noble, and wealthy family in the Earth Kingdom, but kept her hidden from the world due to her blindness, and proclaimed her to be weak, and unsuitable. After running away, she learns a different version of Earth Bending from the Badger Moles who, like her, were blonde, but were able to Earth Bend in a way that allowed them to see the environment in their own way, and move around freely. Tof also used this ability to sneak out of the estate of her parents, 
and join an underground earth-bending fight tournament where she became known as the Blind Bandit. With Zuko and Iroh, Iroh was the firstborn of late Fire Lord Ezulin and Fire Lady Illa, older brother of Ozai, and retired general of the Fire Nation military force, and gained the title Dragon of the West due to slaying the last dragon in his youth. He had a son named Lu Ten who died during the failed siege of Ba Sing Se, and was also the first heir to the throne. Zuko was the son of Fire Lord Ozai, and Princess Ursa, and Azula's older brother, and was also the banished prince due to Ozai exiling him from his home, and wouldn't allow him to return until he captured the Avatar. Once the clones dispersed, and Naruto gained this info, he was indifferent about the whole ordeal. The first being the Avatar who people seemed to praise like a god in human form for his abilities in bending the four elements, and keeping balance amongst the world which didn't sit well with him, and for a good reason. The first was that the current avatar was a 13, chronologically 113, year old boy with little to no idea on how the real world operates, and believes that since he was the avatar, people would be expected to listen to his wisdom which would give the teenager an ego. This reminded him of how his relative Nagato Ozumaki or his alias Pain acted believing that he was a god, and everything he did was for the sake of everlasting peace since the shinobi world was a cycle of hatred, greed, and destruction. Naruto learned firsthand that an everlasting peace was nothing more than an illusion that would never happen, as long as humans existed, but there were short periods of peace which was more of a sign of neutrality amongst enemies until they grew strong enough to start another war. Naruto theorized that if this boy believed that he could bring permanent peace, and failed to do so then the backlash would be catastrophic, and would turn out just like Nagato, and Abido only on a higher scale since he is more in tune with his emotions, and doesn't know how to suppress certain ones. This didn't sit well with him, but he couldn't just outright kill the kids since the avatar would be reborn into a different nation, and it would take years to find the boy slash girl so he settled with trying to find a way to remove the influence of the avatar from the world so that the people themselves would have to learn how to fend for themselves, and not rely on the decisions of one person. The blonde sage sighs in annoyance, and rubs the back of his head. Shikamaru always said that I was troublesome in getting into things I should stay out of, but if I did I wouldn't be me. He chuckles, as he sits up, and dusts his pants, realizing that it was nightfall. Before heading to his lodging he quietly entered Azula's room, noticing the princess was sleeping in a peaceful manner. He crouched down next to her, and placed the tip of his index, and middle fingers on the girl's forehead, and closed his eyes in concentration, as he entered her memories. When he searched through them, he saw her parents, uncle, cousin, and brother. From one of the distant memories, she noticed that years back, she and Zuko were close, as siblings, playing, and laughing together with their mother and father watching. But then a few years later the happy family started to slowly drift, mainly due to Ozai's jealousy towards his older brother, and his accomplishments in the military, and the favor Iroh gained from their father only made him resent the man more which ended with him being more infatuated with power, and willing to do anything he could to get it, even if it meant sacrificing his family to do so. From Azula's memories, he witnessed the man trying to convince his father to pass Iroh's claim to the throne to him in order to keep the royal bloodline from passing due to the death of Iroh's only son. Apparently Azulin was furious with what his second son suggested, and decided to punish by having the man kill his firstborn to see the pain Iroh had to go through. Naruto frowned when he saw Ozai was gonna go through with taking Zuko's life since the young prince was in his eyes a disgrace, an embarrassment, and it was only through the pleas of his wife that he spared his son and knew her husband wanted the throne badly, and devised a plan that resulted in the death of the old Fire Lord, and banishment of Ursa. Naruto couldn't help, but admire Ursa's sacrifice to save her son, and decided to look into some older memories. He got around to some of a younger Azula, and her father who found out that she was a fire-bending prodigy, and started to take her under his wing much to his wife's disapproval, and had her go through vigorous training regiments ranging from her studies to being taught by the best. He pretty much trained her to be a perfectionist where failure was not an option, and showing mercy or any form of compassion for the weak was irrelevant. The young sage was angered at how he pushed his daughter physically, and mentally, and even had her harm others in order to make her prove her worth to him, and if she didn't meet his expectations he threatened to never love her, and consider her dead weight like her failure of a brother, and he even went so far. As to a hypnotic technique he learned to make her a mere image of himself. With that Naruto cut off the technique in order to prevent himself from releasing murderous intent around the house, and calm himself down for a few seconds. He gazed back at Azula's peaceful form, and couldn't help, but pity her. She was forced to become something at such a young age without any say in it all because that fool wanted to create a true heir like he was. 
He made a mental vow that if he ever got Ozai in his line of sight, he'd make the man wish he was never born. After pondering for a bit he decided to do something that would possibly undo some of the damage Ozai did to her mentality even though it won't be much. It was better than nothing because if Azula ever broke down mentally, she'd never recover from the stress, and would slowly kill her. He performed a few hand seals, and placed his hands over her head, and they glowed white. Azula's expression went from tense to relaxed, as he carefully removed his hands. He leans forward, and gives her a gentle kiss on the forehead before pulling away, and smiles when she sighs in content, and smiles warmly. Sweet dreams time, he whispered, and vanished into the shadows. The next morning, Naruto was sitting on top of the roof watching the sun rise up in the mountains, pondering what he had learned last night about this world. He knew the chances of him returning to his old world would pretty much be impossible since he didn't have any time-space techniques that could send him back. But the main reason he didn't want to go back is because with him being the vessel of the reformed Jubi every ninja, and Kage would be after him not just for the Biju's power, but the abilities of his bloodline the Rinnegan. Knowing this did hurt, but he realized it was better this way. Hey Naruto? A feminine voice said behind the blonde. Naruto turned his head, and saw Azula standing behind him with her hair down, and tied in a low ponytail. Naruto smirked when he saw her, and noticed the nervousness in her eyes. You know Azula you look a lot cuter with your hair down like that. It brings out your inner beauty. He said in a teasing tone which made Azula blush, and strokes one of her bangs back from the compliment, but then pauses, and glares at him. You're teasing me aren't you? She questioned, and Naruto's eyes smiled. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not, he said which made her huff up. She decided to sit next to him, and stare at the rising sun with him, remaining silent for a few minutes before speaking up. You know Naruto I can't help, but say that you have an odd hair color. Tai Lee was right when she said your hair resembled the sun. Maybe you should wear something to cover it up, she advised humorously. Naruto brushes his hair back, and snorts at the thought of hiding his hairdo from sight. There is no way I'm covering my hair, and I'm definitely not shaving it. It took me forever to get my hair the way I wanted, he replied. It gains a lot of attention especially from the ladies who say it gives me a rugged yet handsome appearance. She laughs slightly, and shakes her head in amusement, but inwardly agrees because it did in her thoughts make him attractive. You are a very odd person Naruto she states all that aside I was wondering if you would like to help me, and my team pursue the avatar? I mean from the fight I witnessed the other day, he was no match for you, and it would be interesting to have you help me I mean my team. She corrected slash asked while he thought about it. Sure why not? I got nothing better to do so I'll help. But I need to know why your nation is afraid of a 13 year old kid? I mean you practically backed him into a corner before his friends arrived? He asked since he needed to know more about this avatar despite gaining knowledge on the incarnation of the planet via his clones, but wanted to hear it from a source who knew more about the workings of this being. Azula nods and starts to explain. As you already know the avatar can bend four elements, but there's a reason why. The avatar represents the cycle of nature, and whenever the past avatar from a nation dies, a new one is reborn so that the balance of the nations is kept in check. For example, the last avatar that lived during the reign of my great-grandfather Sozin was a firebender named Roku. After he died the avatar was reborn, as an air nomad, the kid who we encountered in that abandoned village. During Sozin's reign he started the war by killing the air nomads in order to stop the cycle. Unfortunately that boy escaped and has now appeared after being gone for 113 years, she explained. Naruto rubbed his chin in thought, coming with a theory on how the young monk survived. So chronologically he's 113, but biologically he's 13? He must put himself in some form of suspended animation in order to pull that off, but doing so will one day take a toll on his person. Yes, but that's not all. From what I read in the history books he has a defense mechanism called the Avatar State. In that form his bending skills are at their maximum and he has no equal when in that form. Azula explained. Interesting, but I'm pretty sure that such power comes at a price. If this avatar state is as powerful as you say then it must have a major weakness. She gave him a look that said explained since she wanted to know Naruto's point of view on the terms of power. Trust me I know this from experience. Every power no matter how great it is has a weakness. I may have mastered the ability to use all the elements, and my bloodline, but I also have my limits. I'm not invincible in any way, shape, or form. I'm just powerful like you are, he replied. Naruto knew, and faced opponents, and allies that were strong in their own right, but knew that they could be killed or weakened if pushed enough, and knew there was no such thing as an invincible warrior. Even his ancestor Rikuto Sinin, while powerful, was still human. So you're gonna be our fourth member Naruto? A voice behind them asked, and Azula, and Naruto turned their heads to see Mai, 
and Tai Li smiling. Naruto smiles and stands up, as does Azula. Yep, it appears so my Chan, he says which confused the three. What does Chan mean to Naruto? Tai Li asks. It's a form suffixing the people at the place I used to live in. They are Chan, San, and Sama. San and Sama are used as a form of respect to those older than you or to those of royalty while suffixes like Chan or Chibi are used on those that are younger than you. There are also others like him which means princess, Oyabun which means boss or chief, Aniki which means big brother or Aniki which means big sister. There are other suffixes like Ne, Anai, Onii or Wani which also refer to brother, sister, or older brother, and older sister, and for little brother or sister you use Otuto or Emuto. There's also another suffix called kun which from my point of view is used in respect for a male by either good friends lovers, or a couple, and the same with chan, but you'd refer to me, as naruto kun. One example is Azula. I'd use him in her name since she is a princess, and I'd use chan for my, and tai li since you're younger than me. Azula would also call her brother Zuko Onii or just ni since he's older than her. He explained while they took that information in. Wait, naruto, what about relatives or older people like my father, mother, uncle? and grandfather. Azula asks, for your dad it would be you or Oyaji, and for your mother it would be Ka. Now for your uncle you'd use Tuji, for your grandfather it would be Aji, and for you aunt or grandmother it would be Ba or Oba depending on how old they are. He stated. Tai Li blinks, and scratches her head in confusion. Wow. Those are some strange suffixes, she said while Naruto snickers. Don't worry you'll understand them in the future. He assured the girl who smiled, and nodded her head. All of that aside Naruto what is it that you specialize in aside from using all the elements? Azula wondered, mainly due to the speed, agility, and prowess he showed facing five benders with one being a fire bending master like she was amazing since she still couldn't get the one-sided fight out of her mind since he made it look easy. Well where I came from I was raised, and trained to be an assassin to do missions that range from escorting important clients, and documents, as well as being a bodyguard for a noble to assassinating a potential threat. I'm skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat, using all forms of weapons, and weapon styles ranging from using needles to a massive blade called a zambato. I'm also well adverse in human anatomy, and its functions, allowing me to read a person's muscle movement, as well as their psyche. I can knock a person out by hitting a certain point in the human body, put them in a death-like state, cripple them permanently or outright kill them if I use a weapon like a kanai or shuriken which are throwing blades. I can strike them in one of the eight vital parts of the human body which are the liver, lungs, jugular vein, clavicle vein, spinal cord, brain, kidneys, or heart. I am also skilled in stealth, and to the point where my targets or opponents don't even notice I'm near them. I can practically sneak up on anyone or through a highly secured place without getting caught, and I'm also skilled in tracking. I can even cast illusions to distract or weaken my opponent, and I also have a huge amount of stamina meaning I won't get tired for a very long time. After his explanation the girls were silent, but on the inside they each had an ear-splitting grin on their face. They just hit the jackpot, and knew with him on their side they stood a higher chance of catching the avatar. I'll have to keep him a secret from my father for a while. If he found out that there was another person like the avatar, and is even more powerful there's no telling what will happen. I already know that I'm nowhere close to being on Naruto's or my father's level since he managed to injure Uncle Iroh who is still stronger than my father despite his age. Azula thought, as she knew once word got out about Naruto, every noble, bounty hunter or assassin will be out to capture or kill him. Now I highly doubt anything would get boring with you around Naruto. Mai said while Naruto grinned. You have no idea how right you are Mai. So do any of you have a plan with how to deal with the kid when we see him, and his friends again? Naruto asks. Azula was about to speak up, but then stops, and notices the fur trail Appa left. The avatar's pet flying bison left a trail of fur for us to follow so it'll be easy for us to track him. She said, after the girls got their things packed up, and Naruto dispelled the house, the four got back in the tank, and followed the trail. Time skip. Three days have passed since Naruto joined Azula, Mei, and Tai Li in their search for the avatar. Right now they stopped to get water, and took a break. Naruto was currently doing some scouting while the girls refilled their water supply. Azula got her water pouch filled up, and stood up until Naruto appeared in her line of sight, surprising them. Azula cried out in surprise clutching her chest while he smirked, and Naruto stopped doing that. His smirk turned into a teasing smile, as she gave him a heated glare. Why? It's kind of fun seeing the fearless princess of the Fire Nation nearly jump out of her skin due to me appearing out of nowhere, he said acting smug. My, entirely giggled from behind their friend, but turned the other way when Azula glared at them, and back at Naruto who was still smirking. 
I am so tempted to fire lightning bolts at you right now. She muttered while he snickered. All joking aside, I found a bigger trail of the flying bison's fur, and it seemed to stop at the edge of a desert that seemed to go on for miles. He started getting wide eyes from them. Naruto the so-called desert that goes on for miles is the Si Wong Desert. It is the largest and hottest desert in the world, and only those who are physically and mentally fit can travel through that place. It's also called the Desert of the Dead, and there is no form of water or barely any life forms inhabiting the place. Azula explained. So it would be foolish for us to travel through there, right? Naruto asks, and gets nods from them. Well then I guess I'm a fool because wherever the brat's heading, I am heading, as well. He said which caused them to fall over, and get back up on their feet, and looked at him like he's crazy. What's wrong with you? In case you haven't noticed, my tank won't get us through that desert due to all the sand dunes formed around the area. And there's also the sand benders, and raiders that lurk through that place. The fire princess says frantically. Yen yeah, Naruto. How do you expect us to get across that god-awful place? The only way that's happening is if you have the ability to traverse through it, which I highly doubt. Mai said, as she twiddled with a throwing knife. She failed to notice the smirk that formed on Naruto's face, but Azula did. Um, my Azula started to say, as Naruto walked a few feet away from them, and slammed his hand on the ground. Kuchios no jutsu, he says, and a large explosion of smoke bursts forward. When the smoke cleared a white snake with red stripes, and yellow slit eyes who was twice as big as Manda appeared coiled up. She takes a look around to adjust to her surroundings, and sees Naruto who was waving at her, and three girls with two who were wide-eyed, and just stared at her. Hey Shiroi-san it's been a while. Naruto called out, and she seemed to smile, and lower her head down to get a better view of him, and once she did her eyes lit up in excitement, and happiness. Naruto-kun, said blonde suddenly found himself being crushed to death, as the massive snake wrapped her tail around him, and nuzzled him with her nose. The other's sweat dropped, as they took in the scene where anime tears fell down her face, as she slowly crushed her summoner who was turning purple, and blue to death in happiness. Everyone thought you were dead after your battle with Toby, but I knew that the heir of the Rakuta no Sanin was still alive, she declared, as she squeezed him tighter. After a few minutes of struggling, Naruto managed to slip out of her coils, and leapt out of her grip. He desperately sucks in a large amount of air, regaining his color back while his healing factor mended any bruised, and possibly broken bones, and organs, mentally thanking himself for placing a thin, and strong layer of earth chakra around his body so he would get crushed to death like last time. It's good to see you in Shiroichan, he said back while the snake wiped her tears away with the tip of her tails. So how may I be of service to you Naruto kun Shiroi asked her summoner. Well me, and my new team here need safe passage through a desert not far from here. He pointed to the three girls where Tai Li and Mai were flabbergasted at the sight before, and tried rubbing their eyes, hoping that this was a dream. So I thought that you could easily get us through there no problem. Naruto finished, as he motioned for the girls in the back to approach him as the snake eyed the surprised, and stunned girls, and flicked her forked tongue. She looks back at Naruto, and speaks. Hmm they are strong in their own way, Naruto-kun. A mischievous gleam formed in her eyes, as she glanced at him, and the three girls. So are you gonna use your clan rights, and claim them, as your future mates? After all, you'll need a few to keep you in check. She asks humorously which made Naruto face fault, and the other three girls blush when she says that. Said blonde got up, and shot an annoyed glare at Shiroi. Shiroi now is not the time for that. Stop hanging out with Bunta. He's a bad influence just like Aero Kyofu. He yelled while she snickered. Heh heh. Sorry I just couldn't help it since it's so easy to get you riled up. She replied. His brow twitched in annoyance. And made a mental note to get back at the Toad Chief later on. And was about to speak up until Mai. And Tai Li appeared in front of him with wide eyes. How did you do that? And how can that giant snake talk? They both cried. And pointed at Shiroi. Naruto took a step back with a surprised look on his face due to seeing them move at speeds only he, his father, and the Yandame Reikage could. That's what I wondered when he summoned a dragon to take us back to the tank, and it could also talk, Azula said, which caused the two girls' eyes to bug out, and look at her like she was nuts. He summoned a talking dragon? Amai, Tai Li, stop yelling before I lose my hearing, Naruto said, as dug his index fingers into his ears to get his hearing back while Azula shook her head. My. And Tai Li looked down at the ground, and tints of pink appeared on their faces while Shiroi watched the scene in hidden amusement. Now then you four hop on my head, and hold on. Shiroi instructed while the four of them got on top of her head. Once they sat down on her head, Tai Li sat on his left, and wrapped her arms around his arm. Mai did the same with his right arm, and Azula, much to his shock, sat in his lap, 
and wrapped her arms around his neck. It took all of Naruto's willpower not to blush or get a nose bleed due to the fact that three hot and beautiful girls' bodies were pressed against him, and was trying not to think about the certain thoughts that went in his brain, and place that he needed to revive his clans with. Azula, Mai, and Tai Li on the other hand had their own thoughts. Whoa his arm is so muscular. I wonder if he can summon cute animals? I'll ask him later. Tai Li thought. Wow. Naruto truly is an amazing person. I wonder what other secrets you have. And what did the snake mean about clan rights? And taking more than one mate. My thought. How in the world is Naruto capable of summoning animals? As well as appearing. And disappearing? It should all be impossible to do. But on the other hand he does smell nice weight where did that come from? Azula thought while his face heated up a little. That was when Shiroi spoke up. All right you four hang on tight because I'm really fast. She said the girls did that. And that was when Shiroi zipped through the forest like a bullet, while the girls' screams echoed through the forest. Siwang Desert. In the middle of the desert a giant white snake was slithering through the sand with four people on top of her head. They were Naruto, Azula, Mai, Tai Li, and Shiroi the snake summon. Naruto placed a barrier around them which kept the sand and wind out, and the girls were currently enjoying the ride. This is so cool. This beats traveling in that metal tank, am I? Tai Li says while the weapon user nods and brushes a strand of her hair back. Azula and Naruto were looking around the desert for any sign of the avatar. Azula was looking through a handheld telescope while Naruto used the Tongei no Jutsu telescope technique to search through the desert with a small glass ball like the third Hokage used to use in Konoha before he died. Azula wasn't kidding when she said that there was barely any life in the desert. Heck this place reminded him too much of Suna's desert, but it wasn't as hot or humid as this place. Azula noticed what looked like a tower-like structure not far from their location. She then taps Naruto on the shoulder and gets his attention. Naruto I see a tower right over there. Azula informed, pointing to the east. Naruto uses his Rinnegan to zoom into the location she pointed at and saw a tower sticking out of the middle of some sand dunes and two life forms. That's not all. There are two life forms standing outside of the tower. One's the blind earthbender, and the other seems to be the flying bison. Shiroi stops. The white snake nods her head, and stops in her tracks, and coils up. Why did we stop Naruto? Tai Li asks the blonde who narrowed his eyes, focusing his attention on Toph, and the bison. That girl is a sensor, and power type Tai Li. She must have the ability to sense vibrations through the ground, as well as read a person's body language, and since she's blind, there's a possibility her other senses are stronger than that of a normal person so we have to take caution with this one. He answered in a serious tone. I could block her earth bending chi like I did to the water bender once. Tai Li offered, but Naruto shook his head. No, that's too risky, especially with that bison around. He'll catch your scent and alert the girl to your presence which would put you in even greater danger. The wind current speed also makes it worse since we're not downwind, and the creature will be able to pick up on our sense a lot faster, he explained. Azula took this info in, and couldn't help, but agree, and trust Naruto's judgment on this since he has more experience with this kind of thing than she did. After thinking about it for a few minutes the fire princess spoke up. Then what do you propose we do then Naruto? Azula asks. My, and Tai Li were surprised at her question. Usually Azula prided herself in her skills, and wouldn't ask for any form of help whatsoever not even from them unless she asked for it. They wondered if Naruto already had an effect on her personality since she seemed to be more relaxed with him around. Naruto thinks about it for a while, and the young sage did a few hand seals, and from his body a wood clone formed, surprising the trio when they saw a second Naruto manifest from the original. WH what is that? Tylee stuttered out, as the clone stood straight up, and glanced back at Naruto, and the three girls. This lady is a clone or second manifestation of me, and can be used in reconnaissance missions, espionage, or to assist me in battle, he answered. The acrobat approaches the clone, and pokes him a couple of times, much to the clone's irritation. Stop that, he said causing the bubbly girl to eep, and zip behind my while Naruto, and Azula chuckle. I forgot to mention that aside from being my replica they can also have the ability to think on their own, and carry a portion of my knowledge, and techniques. He informs the girls before pulling out a tri-pronged kunai with a mixture of seals on it, and looks at his clone. Once the girls, and I are inside the tower I want you to keep that earth bender, and the bison distracted, as long as possible. How will we get into the tower Naruto? Azula wondered, as he turned his gaze at the tall building. I want each of you to grab onto me, and whatever you do, don't let go for even a second, he warned. Azula noticed the seriousness in his voice, and nodded while he threw the kunai into the entrance of the tower. My, entirely each grab an arm while Azula wraps her arm around his waist, 
each keeping a firm grip on him before vanishing in a flash of yellow. Wan Shirtong's library. In a flash of yellow, Naruto, Azula, Mai, and Tai Li appeared before the Kanai, as well as in the middle of what appeared to be a large library filled with countless books. The blonde sage looked around, and whistled lowly at the countless books in the place. If Sakura was here she'd be having a field day. He noticed the girls were looking at the countless books, but hadn't released them yet. Girls, I know I'm cute, but could you please release me? He asked with humor etched in his voice. Azula, Mai, and Tai Li looked back at him, and noticed they were still holding on to him, and in an instant released him with a tint of pique forming on their cheeks, much to his amusement. I have to say I've never seen so many books in my life. Tai Li nodded in agreement. Yoi didn't even have this many books in the Fire Academy. Mai on the other hand scoffs. Thank Agni those days are over because studying from those books was troublesome. She commented. Naruto heard the word troublesome leave her lips, and snickered, getting the knife user's attention. What's so funny? She questioned. Sorry Mai-chan, but when you said troublesome, it reminded me of a friend of mine named Shikamaru. He replied he was one of the sharpest minds from my village who was able to plan ahead of his opponents, and was also a keen strategist who could think up plans on the go, as easily, as breathing, but was lazy, as hell, and spent his time either cloud watching or playing strategy games. Honestly if the guy had any ambition he'd be a threat even to me. Mai however huffed at the insinuation that she was some kind of lazy bum. For the record I'm not lazy. I just don't like being bored or doing boring things. She informed me. Azula was about to say something. But her eyes widened when she saw a large owl stare down at them. Mai and Tai Li looked up as well and were wide-eyed as well. Naruto didn't look as shocked as they were and kept a calm and passive expression. That's a big bird. He muttered as the giant owl spread its wings and descended to the ground and loomed over them. Greetings humans, what brings you to my lair? The owl questioned in a deep and otherworldly tone as he looked at them with a keen eye. Naruto steps forward with his Rinnegan activated with a stoic and calm expression on his face. Wouldn't it be wise for the person who speaks first to give his or her name before asking for the name of the guests? Naruto replied calmly as he was eye to eye with the owl. The giant bird of prey gazed into Naruto's eyes and was surprised to sense the power flowing through them before nodding. My apologies, I am Wan Tong, the spirit of knowledge, guardian of this great library, and he who knows 10,000 things, he introduced. Naruto nodded in acknowledgement, as the owl introduced himself. Greetings Wan Tong sen I am Naruto Ozumaki Namikaze, successor of the Rikudo Senin or the Sage of the Six Paths, and these are my companions Princess Azula of the Fire Nation, and her friends Tai Li, and Mai, he introduced with a bow. It is a pleasure to meet you all, but I'm afraid you must leave, as humans have not been allowed to enter my library for centuries due to abusing the knowledge they seek for their own gain," Wang Shitong said, but a sly smile took form on Naruto's face. Now we both know that is not true my friend because I know the Avatar, and his friends are here, as well so do we not deserve a chance to learn a bit of the vast knowledge this place holds," Naruto requested. The spirit was surprised that this young man before him was able to see through his lie so easily and looked for any form of deceit in the sage's eyes. Very well then, I see no form of deceit in your eyes young sage so I'll allow you and your friends to use my library and any other sources to your liking. His gaze turned fierce and his feathers bristled a bit. But know this if you betray my trust one will not hesitate to end you or your companions. Naruto nodded in agreement. I give you my word and swear on my title, clan's honor and life that we will not abuse any of the knowledge your library holds and will take responsibility should we break your trust. He assured the owl who accepted his word, and the trust laced in them. Before I allow you passage to my library do you each have anything to contribute? Azula looks through her travel bag, and pulls out a scroll. I have a scroll, and a journal with the scroll containing instructions on advanced firebending, and lightning generation, and my great-grandfather's diary. She offered the great owl who brought his right wing forward in front of scroll, and book before pulling the appendage back with the items vanishing. These will make a fine addition, especially the firebending scroll and history of your ancestor princess, but I advise that you follow your own path and not the one others made for you, as it will end in turmoil," he advised. The princess looked a little troubled, but nodded. Tai Li stepped forward with the scroll and held it out. I offer a scroll on my chi blocking technique that I've learned and mastered. She offered, and like the others, they vanished under his wing. This is acceptable. Chi blocking is a very rare and new art so you must be highly skilled in learning such an art. The acrobat smiles at the praise before stepping back, and allowing Mai to step forward with a manual. It's not much, but I have a manual on weapons forgery for the special knives I made, 
and one with the blueprints on the design of the projector launchers I keep hidden under my sleeves. She offered, and got a nod of acceptance from him. These will indeed make a fine addition to the weapons sector of my library. And he turned his gaze to Naruto. And what do you offer young sage? A couple of things that will interest you greatly. He pulls out one of the large scrolls on his back, and places it on the ground. The owl watches with interest, as Naruto unravels the scroll that had several odd containment seals on it, taps one of them, and in a puff of smoke one scroll, and three books appear my first contribution to you is a scroll that contains the knowledge of my mother's clan who were respected, and feared for their skills in fuenjutsu or sealing arts. The next book was white with the yin yang symbol on the cover. This is a book based on the history of my ancestor who once saved the world I came from, from destruction, and the creator of all the ninja arts, as well as the history of the elemental nations. The other book had a green cover that said Tale of the Gutsy Ninja. This is the first novel my godfather wrote during his time, as a shinobi, and describing the nature of the human heart in various forms both positive and negative. Once your tongue reaches out, and swipes the items under his wings, and they vanish. These offerings will be very interesting to read, as will the history of you people, and the last contribution. Naruto had to suppress a huge grin that was threatening to escape his visage, and held out a limited edition gold-covered Aika Aika book with Jiraiya's signature written on the left-hand corner. This I believe you'll personally find very entertaining. He hinted, getting a curious expression from Wan Shirtong. He takes the book in his feathered appendage, and uses the other to open up the book, and read the inscriptions of the pages for a little before a tint of pink appeared on his face, and giggles in a manner that the girls didn't like for some odd reason. Naruto had to fight the urge to laugh out at their expression, and the one from the Wan Shirtong. Oh my this I shall cherish greatly he said to himself, as he turned a page, and continued to giggle again before stopping, and looking at the group. Enjoy the library he said before moving backwards into the shadows with the giggle echoing around the area. Naruto shook his head in amusement that a spirit, as great, and wise, as the owl was a pervert. Kyofu was right, everyone was a pervert at heart no matter who they were. Azula was the first to speak up once Wan Shirtong was gone. Naruto if I may ask? What was that book that gave you the spirit of knowledge, and why did he giggle like that? She questioned with a hint of her demanding tone laced in her words. Tai Li and Mai were also curious about the book while Naruto was inwardly sweating bullets, as they each had their gaze on him. Trust me the less you know the better, was all he said. Mai and Tai Li nodded in acknowledgement, but Azula didn't look too convinced, and vowed to herself to find out about the contents of that book. Now then let's enjoy the library, but I thought we were here to catch Avatar not read up on the history of the nations. Azula thought only to receive a smirk from Naruto. Patience Haim, we'll get the cue ball soon enough, but it wouldn't hurt to find some knowledge that would benefit us in the future. After all knowledge is power, and from my experience if they're looking for a way to end this war soon, then it's possible that there will be some info in this library that will help them find a weakness in your home's defense, and could spell disaster for your nation and people. He says, Azula wanted to make a remark, but stopped and thought about it since it was a possibility that the Avatar's group could find such a thing in this vast library. You do make a good point, but what can we do? You did promise the Great Spirit that we wouldn't abuse the knowledge in his library, and the one thing I never want to do is anger a spirit because that is a fate worse than death," she said. Naruto pondered on this before a smirk crossed his face. You leave that to me, go ahead, and start finding some books, and scrolls that could benefit us. I'll be checking on the bald monk, and his group to see what they're up to. With that Naruto vanished in a burst of wind, leaving the girls to do their part. Planetary Calendar Room From the shadows, Naruto followed Aang's energy signature into a room that looked similar to a planetarium, and had to admit this was a very impressive invention. He watched Sokka turn the dial a few times in order to match the calendar, and dates, and heard him wanting to find out about the darkest day in Fire Nation history. He watches the symbol of the sun and moon rotate until they merge, and stop in place. Hey what happened? Why did the sun and moon stop in place? Does this date represent the darkest day in the Fire Nation? She asked. Katara doesn't speak so loud in front of the fox who's buddies with the owl. He whispered to his sister, and saw the kitsune whimper in a dejected manner. So I was right. They are misusing this place for this war. I think I should inform my fine feathered friend about this. He vanished in the shadows once more to find Wan Shirtong. Different sector of the library. The animal spirit was perched on a statue, giggling quietly to himself as he was reading the 10th chapter of the masterpiece Naruto gave him. Oh this book keeps getting better and better. The sage's grandfather is a true artist to create something so amazing he said to himself. Naruto appeared before the owl crouching down slightly, and stood up, only for a sweat drop to form on the back of his head, as he saw the spirit's giggling form. 
Okay spirits are definitely perverts. He thought before coughing out loudly. Wan Shirtong paused and looked up to see Naruto with an amused expression on his face. And the owl also sported a look of annoyance. Is there a reason why you've come to interrupt my reading young sage? He asked with a hint of irritation in his voice. My apologies friend, but the reason I was searching for you is because someone is misusing the knowledge of your library. The owl's expression turned serious at what Naruto told him. Thanks for watching my video, and make sure to check out the author of this fanfic. Link is in the description. See you next time, till then sayonara.